Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to another very special session of our Gospel Truth broadcast. I'm interviewing Dr. Grady McMurtry. We've been talking about the flood of Noah, and we have shared some things that, I mean, are just profound. And, um, Grady, I want to just make this point. We were talking off camera, but, you know, there's a lot of evolutionists who believe in evolution because it's a convenient theology. It makes them not accountable to God. And I can understand that, and there's a bent on it, but the facts aren't there, so they just choose to believe it. They choose to believe it. But what gets me are Christians who embrace it, and whether they call it theistic evolution or whatever, just because I guess they are intimidated into believing that this is absolute fact, and they just haven't examined the facts. And those are the ones that I'm really hoping to reach with these truths that you've been presenting because uh, evolution and the Bible are not compatible. They are 100% uncompatible. That's right. And they ch do choose to believe it. As we said, a, a religion of convenience, a way of saying that I can lead a sinless life without Christ. It's a justification for every kind of immorality that they want to practice. So it is a philosophical belief. It is not a scientific belief because science simply disproves evolution. And, you know, this would probably offend the evolutionists, but I've, um, I've offended a lot of people, so I don't mind doing it. But it really is senseless because the facts don't support it. Well, all one needs to do is simply use the argument by design that, that Paul used in Romans 1, for instance, uh, St. Augustine of Hippo used 400 years later and so forth, the argument by design that when you see design, you know there's a designer. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can look at a comb, which is a one-piece yeah. machine, mm -hmm. and see design, how can you not look yeah. at biological life and realize that it takes a designer to create it? If we were to land on Mars and they found a house that was built, which isn't a living organism. It's nothing complex like any of the stuff that we're talking about. But if you found a house on Mars, I guarantee you everybody would be saying, there's life on Mars, because it couldn't just evolve. It wouldn't have doors and windows, and that's an inanimate object. To see all of this life and believe that it evolved without somebody designing it is uh, senseless. It is not intelligent. Well, that's because, as I say, the belief in evolution is irrational, unreasonable, illogical, and unscientific. It is. And so Christians who believe in it, it has to be just because they haven't been informed. I well, don't think. what has happened is the church has not done a good job of teaching creation. They've not only done a lousy job of teaching creation from a theological standpoint and show why it's so important to the Christian faith, they've also failed to teach the science because somehow or another they think science is foreign. Well, the fact of the matter is that the single greatest scientists who have ever lived have always been Christians and creationists. You know, you go back to Francis Bacon, Isaac Newton, but you can go to Faraday and Boyle and Maxwell and all these others, Pasteur and George Washington Carver. and it, Every one of them are, you know, the founders of scientific fields, the finders of the single greatest scientific discoveries have always been practically to a man or woman a creationist. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. I go to the Grand Canyon, and I love going in the mountains. We four-wheel, and we go to these national parks, and they'll say that 150 million years ago or 500 million years ago, this strata of rock, and, and it's just presented as fact, and they say that this proves evolution, and yet the flood is how all of this stuff was put down. I'd like That's you right. to address that. Well, you have to remember, first of all, with the evolution is talking about millions and billions of years, it is imaginary. They made it up in their own imagination. There. First of all, they were not there. They <laughs> cannot document it. That's true. Scientifically, you're dealing with a historical event that cannot be scientifically proven. The scientific method cannot be used to do things like that because it's outside of the scope of science, which deals with here and now. Secondly, of course, you've got people who, again, uh, and as I say, the church has done a lousy job of doing this, haven't shown the science behind this, such as we were talking about previously, you know, but let's take a look at what's really in the ground versus what's in the textbooks because to me this is critical. Again, growing up in the paleontology laboratories at Berkeley, fossils and, and the various sedimentary layers in which you find the fossils. Mm -hmm. The first thing you have to remember is this. On the Earth's land surface, 
75 to 80 percent is covered with dried out mud layers containing trillions of dead plants and animals that all drowned. Now that ought to tell you that it's a worldwide flood mm -hmm. right there, that this is not slow and gradual accumulation. As a matter of fact, we now know that fossilization is rapid, and you, to get a fossil, would have to have it buried rapidly. It can't be slowly or it would decay. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, though, of the 75 to 80 percent of the entire Earth's land surface that is covered with dried out mud layers, that's sedimentary rock, because sedimentary rock is just dried out mud. Mm -hmm. 80 to 85 percent of that does not even have three layers in the order shown in the textbooks. Oh, so, there's, so their evolutionary model is not consistent. consistent with what's in the ground. You say they show the geological time scale or the geological time column in the textbook and then teach you that that's the way it is in the ground, but that's not true. That is a reconstruction by taking a layer in Africa and a layer in Asia and a layer in North America and putting them in the order they want them. No, really. So this whole thing so about pre Cambrian and I forget. Well, th those are names. Yeah, but I mean, all of these names ascribed to this is stuff that you can't see consistent. Absolutely not consistent. The earth. Absolutely not consistent at all. Again, 80 to 85 percent doesn't even have three layers in the order shown in the textbook. What we find are layers upside down, out of order, missing, or interlaced, where it goes older, younger, older, younger, older, younger, according to the evolutionary teaching. Now, do they explain this, or do they, again, just ignore this? They ignore it. They try to hide it. Here's a picture of the Rocky Mountains, and, and here we see layers in the ground. I mean, these are mm -hmm. fairly easy to see layers. Sure. If you take a close look at this, you will notice that if evolution was true, you'd expect these layers to be nice and flat, because when water lays down layers, water seeks its own level, water lays mm -hmm. down flat. Mm -hmm. But first of all, you'll notice that actually you see undulations. Uh -huh that these are actually wave-like things. Also notice the alluvial material. That's the, that's the erosion material here at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Now, first of all, if those mountains are supposed to be three, 300 million years old or whatever, according to whichever evolution you talk to, where is the erosion material? Because this is not enough. This only supports a few thousand years. So they've got a big problem. But then if you say, well, it washed off into the rivers, such as the Colorado. Well, how come there's only 4,500 years worth of mud at the mouth of the Colorado then? You see, mm -hmm. the physical evidence doesn't support the story. Now let's take a look. This comes from Montana. Now here you see sedimentary layers laid down flat by water, but they're standing basically upright, and you'll notice they're curving, and you'll notice they're not broken. I challenge everybody listening to this program Always, always, always look in the road cuts. It's free research. You've already yeah. paid for it. <laughs> Stop and look. Slow down and look. You see layers on the side of the road. Often they're flat. Often they look nice and planar, you know, and so forth. But if you just keep looking, you'll see undulations. You'll see sometimes they'll turn and meet another at a 90-degree angle. You'll see layers that are standing upright. Now, remember, these were, these were laid down flat this way, but today, you know, instead of being this way, they're now this way, or folded, but you can't bend rock. So what does this mean to see so these in the This in means the that these are, are the layers of sedimentary rock, mud laid down by the flood of Noah, then folded by tectonic forces, the movement of continents and so forth, after the flood, while they're still wet, and then only after they have been folded, they dry out into hard rock. For instance, here's a nice little section. Now remember that this picture is in the right orientation. So this is basically up and down, but uh -huh. you see these Z-shaped curves. Now again, you can't, you can't bend sedimentary rock, it'll break. This is not metamorphic. Now metamorphic has been heated and, and you can bend that. But this is sedimentary rock. You cannot bend it without breaking it, which proves that this had to be done while it was still wet. This comes from the area near San Juan Capistrano. Now notice here, you'll even see swirls, waves, mm -hmm. circular patterns that seem to be swirls that are frozen in time. But remember that that had to be done in moving water. Here you can see layers going straight up and down here. And so this is absolutely rapid. All of that material, not just 10 feet, 100 feet, even thousands of feet, had to all be deposited at one time. This comes from California, but you see some very tightly folded hairpins here in the Sierras. Or, 
here's a nice little 90 degree curve right here. And of course, we've got the lady standing there to give you a little perspective on that. Uh, here's another curve. This is what I'm talking about with road cuts. Now, notice a couple things here. Notice that there's some folded layers down here that uh -huh. were cut off and then other layers laid down on top very, very quickly. This shows rapid deposition. Here's another 90 degree curve right here. Here, you see a, the, the, the young lady standing there, and it may not be real easy to see in the picture, but take a look. You can actually see this is a hairpin. Yeah. I put the superimposing here, but you can actually see it comes here and turns very, very tight in a hairpin turn. Mm -hmm. That had to be while this material was still in a very liquid state. Uh, it was mud, but still very, very wet, or it would have been broken. Now, this is what I was talking about with things like rapid for formations of things like the Grand Canyon after the flood. Uh, we see this kind of rapid formation all over the world, these folded layers. And it shows you that everything was deposited very quickly. Now, at Colorado State University, there's a great sedimentation laboratory there. Now, this comes from a secular university. Colorado State is certainly a secular university, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. But experimentations done there in their great sedimentation laboratory have proven all layers form at the same time and merely extend in the direction of water flow. So what we're saying is this. If you have moving water, all the layers, the bottom layer and the top layer, form at the same time, but extend as the water flows in that direction. All layers form at the same time. That proves the layer on the bottom is the same age as the layer on the top. Now, if that is accurate and if that's proven, that disproves evolution. It disproves it? evolution. It shows that what we have are fossils in the ground, yes, dead animals, dead plants from the flood of Noah, buried in wet mud layers. But these layers are often out of order, upside down, backwards. But the, these layers all formed at one time. Now, again, this comes from the, the Washita Mountains in Arkansas and Oklahoma. You can see sedimentary rock layers standing straight up. This is outside of uh, Denver on I-70. I've seen that. And, but think about it. Those are, look mm -hmm. at all those layers had to come into existence at one time. The entire thing had to be Okay, folded. so this was laid down by water. Had to be laid down this way by water. And then the folding, tectonic forces folding layers forced that entire thing to come up. And this is again near McCoy in Colorado. Again, you have these tightly deposited mm -hmm. layers here. But again, they're staying practically straight up. Now you can see these different layers, and so this is what, wave after wave of sedimentation? Well, it's, it's either reoccurring waves or it's, again, all at one time, with, again, all of them being simply deposited by the, the movement of water in one direction. Well, I'm, I may not be sharp enough to catch what you're saying, but I can, I've seen mountains where you see the different colors. So the stratas are definitely different. Mm -hmm. Were those all put down at one time, or was a layer put again, down and all, then another layer? Again, all put down at one time by the flood. And so what accounts for the different colors? Again, this is different kinds of rock. It could be anything from limestone to shale to slate to whatever. But uh, I was just going through here. This is near, near Dinosaur Monument. Mm -hmm. Notice that 90-degree turn at the top yeah. of the mountain here. But other layers over here folded in a different way. This is an S-shaped yep. band and so forth. Now, I want to get down to the uh, Grand Canyon of northern Arizona. Well, those are great examples right there. Well, that's just these, these are wonderful things. but. That's beautiful. This is Arizona. This is called the wave. Yes, I've, I've not been there, but I've seen it. And here you see a tremendous, uh, this is not even the best picture I've got of it, but this is just a tremendous area where you see basically every kind of sedimentation you can in one deposit. You have folding, you have interlacing, you have shearing, you have cross hatching. Basically every kind of sedimentation all in one spot, showing that it all happened very, very quickly. Now, uh, this is an area in New Mexico. Again, you notice here are just dozens and dozens of layers that were laid down flat, folded, but then after they were folded, they were sheared off at the top, and another layer folded, or deposit, excuse me, on top, going in another direction. Now, what caused that? Again, this is the flood. This is where currents in the water are moving in different directions. This is as the waters rise and come down because you've got 300 days of, 150 days of waters rising, 150 days of it going down, mm -hmm. you have tidal tsunamis, which after some layers have been deposited and start to fold, then have been sheared off by a, a tidal tsunami. These are all called turbidite deposits, that mean they're all deposited underwater. 
And uh, let's take a look at the Grand Canyon. Notice right here. Now, here in the Grand Canyon, this is a close-up of the Red Wall Limestone and the Cambrian Muav layers down here. Notice that they are interlaced. That is to say that they are mixed. You've got one, then another, then another, going mm -hmm. back and forth, showing that this was not the clean-cut thing that evolutionists say of different ages, but in fact was simply as these water currents are moving, depositing one layer of material that's dissolved someplace and then another one here, and as the currents are moving back and forth, different layers are being deposited in this order, showing that, again, this is not consistent with what evolutionists claim. And at the Grand Canyon, we actually have layers that are missing. For instance, there's 140 to 160 million years missing up here, 10 million missing up there, according to evolutionary yeah. thinking. And so the fact of the matter is that sometimes we see very you know, smooth, flat lines, but there's 10 million years missing. Now, think with me for a second about this, because it's very important. When you look at these layers in the ground, such as the one you see right here, think with me. If the one was deposited and another one was deposited later, there'd have to be some period of time during which each layer was exposed before the next layer was deposited on top, right? Mm -hmm. Why are there no soil horizons between them? Now, what's a soil horizon? Where some of the rock had eroded into soil. Okay. Why are there no V-shaped erosion marks? Because if these had been exposed, mm -hmm. rain falls on it, erodes a V-shaped erosion mark where water is cutting into the rock, that would be filled in by the next layer of mud coming in on mm -hmm. top, but it's not there. Why are there no animal holes? Why are there no root holes? It shows you that all of this was deposited at one time in a really big flood, that these layers were not exposed one after another after another. That's awesome. And how do the evolutionists deal with this? They don't. They simply try not ever to bring it up. I guess really the evolutionists are only able to gain the ground that they do because of people being uninformed. And well, that's so just it. The they, they, they rely on people being uninformed. They rely on being deceitful with their material, tricking people into believing that they're right. They censure science. They censure good science and only show you that which can be interpreted using their explanation. They tell a fairy tale for adults and they deceive people into believing it's real, but when you really take a look at it in depth, you realize it's not. It's fictitious. So it goes back to that people anti-God, wanting to not have accountability, want to believe in evolution. They only look at the stuff that supports this. They only present the things that support their position, suppress or ignore the other information. They knowingly suppress the evidence. That's exactly what Paul said in Romans chapter 1. They know it's not true, but they suppress it anyway. They willingly are ignorant willingly. of this. <laughs> yes. And then we have what are called polystrate fossils. Now polystrate fossils where we find tree trunks, for instance, growing straight up and down, supposedly, according to evolution, and yet what we have are trunks up to 80 feet long, have no roots, no tops, they're just tree trunks, fossilized, but sticking through many, many layers. And these layers represent hundreds of millions of years. Supposedly they re represent hundreds of thousands to millions. And so how did a tree stand through all of those years of deposit? Yeah. It's impossible. I have a collection of these from all over the world. Uh, at Cookville, Tennessee, the Kettles Cook Mine, uh, Kettles uh, Coal Mine, uh, there's a 30-foot long tree trunk. Its bottom starts in coal with no roots. It goes through a middle layer of sedimentary rock, and it ends in a coal seam at the top, but there's no top. So here's a 30-foot long tree trunk penetrating three layers. The top and bottom have turned to coal. The middle layer is rock. It's petrified. And yet there's no tops or bottoms, which proves it obviously did not grow there. What happened was it was growing someplace else because of a catastrophic event, such as a volcanic explosion. It was torn off its roots, tops torn off or destroyed, deposited in wet mud layers in an upright orientation. Now at Mount St. Helens in 1980 in Spirit Lake, we actually saw the formation uh, of today roughly 40,000 tree trunks standing upright at the bottom of the lake that didn't grow there. They have no tops, they have no bottoms. Specimen Ridge at Yellowstone National Park. The whole ridge is full of tree trunks, stumps. Some are laying down, but some are standing upright. But there's stumps without trees, trees without stumps. Many of the trees penetrate more than one layer, uh, showing that this is all one catastrophic event. It is not slow and gradual accumulation. That is just impossible to refute. I mean, I can't see any argument against it. 
Well, that's just it. Evolutionary uh, geologists don't refute it. They may hide it, but they can't refute it. Have you ever debated an evolutionist on these things and sure. confronted them? How do they respond? Well, first of all, we defeat them every time. Because what really happens, uh, I, I, I don't think debates serve much purpose, frankly. But what really happens is we talk about science, they talk about religion. They pound the pulpit and say, you've got to believe in evolution. We start talking about the first and second law of thermodynamics, the laws of genetics and so yeah. forth. We talk about layers out of, out of order in the ground. We talk about polystrate fossils and, and whatever. That second law of what? Thermodynamics, thermodynamics is where everything goes from order to disorder. And yet Spontaneous evolution. Spontaneous degeneration. And evolution is the exact opposite. It goes from disorder to extreme order. It, Correct. It's unobservable in creation. It has never been observed in science. Mm -hmm. Never. Evolution believes you go from the simple to the complex by random chance. But any school book teaching general science, even at the seventh grade level, would tell you spontaneous generation has been disproven. The, mm -hmm. the experiments of Francesco Reddy, 1668, or the experiments of Louis Pasteur in the mid-1800s have proven categorically what the Bible says. Life only comes from life and only reproduces after its own kind. So all that science has ever proven is that life only comes from life, that life does not come from rocks by random chance. That yeah. we started perfect because of human sin, we're in a state of decay. That's the second law, consistent with the second law, consistent with the first law, consistent with the law of biogenesis. It's all consistent with the scientific laws. But evolution is absolutely inconsistent and contradictory to every single scientific law. And you know, I just became aware of this recently, but I thought evolution was relatively recent with Darwin primarily. And I've gone back and found out that there were people back during the time of Christ that were preaching the same type of thing. It was the same concept, maybe with different terminology. But men have been trying to uh, explain away creation and the testimony it gives of God for millennia. Andrew, you can trace evolutionary philosophy back to the Garden of Eden. First of all, for 600 years prior to Christ, there were Greek and Roman philosophers teaching evolution. Anaximander, Democritus, Empedocles. I say, I didn't know that. I hate to say it, but we've got less than a minute left. And I do want to encourage the people that are watching. This is Grady's website that we have on our screen. And I tell you, I, I just look, took a brief look at it, and you've got a lot of material. Deal with a lot of different things. It would, be, it would encourage you to follow these things up. And if you're one of those Christians who still believes in evolution and you think this can't be, I encourage you to check out the information. I encourage you to go and check it out instead of just swallowing what everybody's saying. So uh, call or write today, follow this information on the screen, and then join us again tomorrow as we conclude this interview with Dr. Grady McMurtry. On today's program, Andrew interviewed Dr. Grady McMurtry. If you'd like to learn more about Dr. McMurtry's ministry, visit his website at creationworldview.org. Andrew's complete teaching titled Christian Philosophy is available in a brand new book for £9.99. Or you can get this teaching in a companion study guide that's perfect for home groups, Sunday schools, and for individual study. It's been designed so that anyone, anywhere, at any time can reach an unbeliever, disciple a new believer, or grow with others in the Lord. Not only is the entire teaching included in the study guide, you can also print off as many copies as you'd like when you download the PDF files from the included data CD. This valuable resource is available for £17.50. This teaching is also available on either CD or DVD as seen on TV for £30. Go to awme.net and click on Today's TV Offer to see the options. Andrew's fifth audio teaching in today's series is titled Creation vs. Evolution Part 1. It's available for £3 when you write or call. But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will send this fifth CD free of charge. You can use your credit card to order resources through our website at awme.net. While you're there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. Or you can order through our helpline Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Our helpline number is 01922 473 300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code then 
473-300. If the lines are busy, remember you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, 7 days a week at awme.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We hope to hear from you today. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events and let the Word of God transform your life. He'll be in Warwick, England next week for the Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe Ministers Conference October 22nd through the 24th, in Kampala, Uganda for a Gospel Truth Seminar October 26th and 27th, and at the Glory of Christ Church in Kampala Sunday, October 28th. He'll also be in the Dallas-Fort Worth area for a Gospel Truth Seminar November 8th through the 10th at Calvary Cathedral in Fort Worth on Sunday, November 11th and in Phoenix, Arizona for a Gospel Truth Seminar January 3rd through the 5th. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, call our helpline or visit our website at awme.net. For me, the biggest um, change personally that's taken place has come from probably the journey of coming here and leaving home, <laughs> coming out to this other place and watching God provide. Me and my entire family have seen major changes because I've had so many layers peeled off from the day I walked in here till now that I, I do have a sure foundation, which I did not have when I walked in these doors. We call the first year detox. It's literally detoxing you, all of the wrong doctrines you've learned throughout the years in different churches and just learning the truth. The biggest change is just getting the bad doctrine out, having the things that were incorrect uh, just through tradition and uh, getting a sure foundation. Getting the full perspective of, of the finished work that Jesus did on that cross and what it means to us, it's finished. It helped me connect the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And I go home, my husband, my husband says, um, he'll ask me, what did you learn? And there are times I just can't talk. It is so good. The biggest change I've seen in my life since I've started um, coming to CBC has been just the peace of God. It says um, that if we keep our minds stayed on Him, He'll keep us in perfect peace. So just from the knowledge of God I've grown in while attending the school, just the peace of God has been multiplied in my life. He brought me here and He, he proved His love to me. Making the decision and taking a step of faith and coming to the school and sitting under the Word of God four hours a day, four days a week has been absolutely amazing and it's actually brought what I've had, what, what the Lord planted in my heart years ago, it, it's brought it to pass and I have just, just a greater understanding of it and I believe that I have uh, a boldness and a surety that I didn't have before coming here that I'll be able to go out and do and fulfill what God's called me to do on this earth, me and my family.